Hello friends, Dr. David Katz, another COVID reality check. This one about the fraught topic of herd immunity and whether even just saying that should be heresy. I don't think so. It's a topic that has warranted discussion for quite some time. It's been highly polarized, highly politicized. Uh, in fact, so much so that, that my usual camp, which is left of center, uh, tends to react as, as if you're sociopathic if you use the term herd immunity with regard to COVID um, and seems to equate it with genocide. That's completely unfounded, although I, I think our big problem here is that we're discussing all aspects of COVID response in a public health house of cards. And what I mean by that is in a house of cards, every every stage of the building is made of cards, is fragile and prone to fall out from under you. In other words, nothing is well built. Well, it really doesn't matter what you do on the third floor, the fourth floor, the fifth floor, however good or sensible it is, if everything underneath that, everything that came before, is fragile and poorly constructed. And that's pretty much where we are with public policy in the United States with regard to COVID. We did not lock down initially in a timely manner. We did not generate clear plans. We did not risk stratify the population. We did not telescope how we were going to move through the pandemic. We didn't talk about phase one, phase two, and how we were going to return to work and school. We didn't talk about total harm minimization and how to balance the prevention of harms from the virus with the balance with, with the prevention of harms related to societal shutdown. We, we didn't do any of these things. We, we've bungled everything. And we never managed to protect the most vulnerable, so we have 185,000 casualties. And so nobody trusts that if we were to move through the pandemic toward herd immunity, we would avoid a high casualty count. And frankly, nobody has a reason to trust that. So we can't seem to talk about herd immunity. But there is a new study just out in the New England Journal of Medicine that gives us reason to have that conversation. This was a study of seroprevalence in Iceland. So seroprevalence means the look for antibodies in the population. And as you would expect with a scientific publication, a prestigious medical journal, it's a bit dense. But essentially what it shows is that people who had symptomatic infection with SARS-CoV-2, uh, for the most part, do develop an antibody response. So people known to have had the infection in Iceland, over 90% develop measurable antibodies. And measurable antibodies are still detectable four months later. So the main framing for this particular article is that immunity develops and it doesn't go away over a span of months which is exactly what we would hope for if we're going to move through the pandemic to herd immunity and get our lives back. The interesting thing is that this article in the New England Journal was immediately parlayed into um, mainstream media coverage, as we might expect, and the Associated Press talks about the preservation of antibodies exclusively as good news about vaccine development. And yes, it's certainly true, the idea that you can induce immunity and maintain an antibody response is good news in terms of vaccine development, but it's also good news in terms of moving through the pandemic while waiting for a vaccine, because there are other key statistical findings out of this study in Iceland. First, of the people who were known to have had infection with COVID and had symptoms, only about 90% made antibodies. In other words, 10% of people who had a symptomatic infection didn't make antibodies. We have prior studies to suggest that many people with lesser levels of infection may never make antibodies, meaning that many, many more people in Iceland may have been exposed than this study suggests and may be partly resistant even though they are not making IgG, the particular kind of antibody that was measured in this study. But even without knowing that, even if we just use the low levels of infection that can be confirmed in Iceland based on antibodies, the researchers suggest that just about 1% of the population of Iceland has been infected. And based on that denominator, the total mortality in the population of Iceland is 
of those infected. In other words, 99.7% of people infected with COVID recovered from it, 0.3% died. But even that is deceptive. And by the way, that, that's three times the total fatality rate associated with seasonal flu, a comparison that some people make and many people argue we shouldn't be making, but three times the mortality, 0.3% um, infection fatality rate. However, the authors went on to note that the fatality, and this is something we've known about COVID all along, is massively concentrated. So the, the fatality rate in people under the age of 70 is 0.1%. In other words, if you're under 70 and you get COVID, 99.9% probability that you will recover from it, 0.1% um, mortality. And if you're over 70, 4.4% uh, overall mortality, so massively higher. So the, the, the risk of death from SARS-CoV-2 is much, much higher in elderly people and very much concentrated in those over 70 and even more concentrated in those over 80. What this means is that if we had a societal response to the pandemic where we actually believed that we could be effective at first identifying those at high risk, it's not just the elderly, it's mostly the elderly, but also people with serious chronic disease, and actually protecting them, then it looks overwhelmingly as if the virus could spread among young healthy people. Overwhelmingly, they would be asymptomatic. Some would have mild symptoms. And it looks as if people who get infected this, with, with this um, virus do often develop antibodies uh, or manifest resistance to it without developing antibodies we can measure. But either way, become immune and that that immunity persists for months. Okay, yes, this is certainly relevant to vaccine development, but it's highly relevant to achieving herd immunity in the natural way that ends most pandemics, which is people get the infection, recover from it, and then are immune to it and can't transmit it to the people who cannot be exposed because they're highly vulnerable. This is hard to discuss. It comes across as heresy, uh, but that's because we now have succumbed, I think, to herd mentality about herd immunity. You almost are obligated to pick a camp. So, you know, on the, on the one hand, uh, you can say herd immunity achieved with exposure to the virus is genocide, it's sociopathic, it, it means we will massively inflate the casualty count. Well, no, that's only if we did it horribly. That's only if we did it wrong. That's only if we fail to protect those who are likely to have a severe bout of COVID or, or to die from it. If we did identify and protect the highly vulnerable, uh, again, we're talking about an overall fatality rate among those infected under the age of 70 that looks to be exactly the same as seasonal flu. And that too has become heresy to, to dare say that, but 0.1% fatality in people under age 70 corresponds almost exactly to seasonal flu. Now, again, that's not zero. It does mean some people in the under 70 group who get exposed could die. Uh, but sadly, being alive carries with it some risk of dying every day of, of something. If the risk of dying from COVID falls below the threshold of risks we accept and encounter in our daily lives anyway, we do need to start having a conversation about striking a, a balance that, that gets us back to life as we knew it before. But it, it's a nearly impossible conversation to have uh, because it's so polarized. And I think it's polarized because we're having it in a house of cards. We've done everything wrong. There's very little evidence to convince anyone that going forward will do any better. And it's absolutely true that if we let large populations get exposed to the virus and we fail to protect the vulnerable, we will massively inflate the casualty rate. So, so that worry is completely valid. But on the other hand, we know how to avoid that we should be able to avoid it. So the data out of Iceland are really important. Um, they indicate that immunity develops. They indicate that immunity persists. They reaffirm that the fatality rate for this infection is a fraction of a percent overall. 
and a tiny fraction of a percent in those under age 70. They reaffirm that risk is massively concentrated in a population we could identify and a population we could protect. And as we think about developing policies to get us the remainder of the way through this pandemic, the question becomes, can we exit the house of cards where everything we do is built on lack of trust and failure, start again with a solid foundation where we risk stratify the population, where we make it perfectly clear what the wide ranging policies are going to be to protect the highly vulnerable. And by the way, those need to include how do we govern interactions between people in lower risk groups and higher risk groups. So, okay, fine. This virus can safely spread among young healthy people. But when young healthy people who may have been exposed interact with older people or people with chronic disease, they have to adopt the strategies of social distancing and, and wearing masks that are appropriate for the higher risk group. So we need some way of knowing who's in what risk group. There are a number of policy elements none of us has seen in the United States and all of us need to see to be reassured that if we are going to achieve herd immunity, it can be done safely. I completely sympathize with those who don't want to even hear the herd immunity discussion because they have no evidence that we can get there safely. We have no evidence because we have failed to do anything right. That doesn't mean it can't be done. It absolutely could be done. I want to see that evidence too. Let's hear discussion of risk stratification. Let's hear discussion of policies that would help manage interaction among risk groups. Let us lay out a comprehensive policy that indicates how the vulnerable will truly be protected because then the data on seroprevalence, the data on lasting immunity, are not just data in support of vaccine development. They're data in support of achieving herd immunity and getting us through this pandemic before we have a reliable vaccine. And frankly, the sooner we get back to life as we knew it before, the better.